I'm Bart Herbison, director of the Nashville Songwriters Association, and this week for the Tennessean, the story behind the song, American Made with Bob DePiro. Bob is in the Songwriters Hall of Fame, and I gotta tell you, we've done about 20 of these in the series, and I wanna take this time to thank the Tennessean for highlighting the song, It All Begins With the Song, and Music City USA. I have not struggled so hard to pick the song. You have literally <laughs> written anthems for every artist that mattered. And Bob, before we get into the story behind the song, how have you stayed so musically relevant for so long with so many changes in country music? Uh, well, you know what, Bart? Here, here's what I do. I, I treat music like I'm a student. And I, I still consider myself a student. And, and I'm not going to graduate. <laughs> I'm just going to keep learning, you know. So I look at everything like a student would, you know. Oh, this is interesting. Oh, this kind of thing is happening now. Okay. And, and it just keeps it fresh, you know. And it's, as trends come and go, you know, uh, it's always about the song, about the story. I mean, it can be propped up with beats or drum machines or an old steel guitar, you know. A, a good song, as far as I'm concerned, is a good song. So I just treat it like that. You know, I'm a student. I'm in Music U, and, and, and I haven't graduated. Part of that's the kid in you. You just, it's still, you love it. It's like it was day one. You know, you? you know, Brett James and I just wrote a song called Never Got Past Seventeen. And that's what we talk about, is keeping the kid alive. And, you know, this I'm just having as much fun as when I first started figuring this out. You know, it's its a joy for me. Well, you were at the prom, but something that got you on the dance card was the story behind the song this week, American Made. It, uh, early on, it really was a huge one. You and Pat McManus, yes. do you remember the day it was born? Uh, I do. I do remember it. Um, I had been kicking around that idea and that title, and we were writing here on Music Row, uh, and I had just kind of put the chorus together. And I remember Pat was walking down the hall. There are these little writer rooms, you know, and there was this hall. And I remember Pat walking down the the hallway saying, hey, man, I'll see you later. i got to go to this session or something. And I said, well, look, before you go, what do you think of this? <laughs> I played him the chorus to American Maid, and he got on the phone and canceled this next <laughs> thing, and we just we just wrote the song. And, and the song did, the verses did go through a couple changes until it finally ended up uh, the record that you hear now. But uh, that's how it happened. I mean, Johnny McRae is an old school mentor that that really was my mentor. You know, coming into a a city and a and a genre that I really had not a lot of clue about, and he really helped us get that song just exactly right because it's a simple song. But I've just been reading this Bruce Springsteen biography where where they say, you know, simple is the hardest thing in the world to do. It is. It, it's, it's very hard. You know, it's very hard to sound like, what? <laughs> you know, but because every word matters, you know, and every, mel every note matters to make it so simple that you can remember it so that it becomes memorable. And that was that song, just simplicity. So you said... You worked on the verses, so you didn't finish it that day. We thought we finished it. Okay. <laughs> we thought it was well, good. Did you change it because you wanted to or because you pitched it and people said No. Uh, as I said, I brought up Johnny McCray in the first. I even remember the first verse. It was like, seems everything I buy these days comes from somewhere else. From the, from, from the kind of car I drive to the dishes on the shelf. <laughs> and okay. I, you know, played this for McCraney. He goes, that's terrible. <laughs> he goes, uh, the whole chorus is a hit chorus, but you got to work on these, on these verses. So, 
we went back upstairs and and kept pounding on those verses until those verses that you hear now came out you know it's funny you said springsteen and i don't know if we've ever discussed this or not and maybe it's happened and i'm not aware of it the way that things arranged i always thought there could be a Mm. rocking version of it too has anybody an indie artist or anybody ever done that and you've heard it no. i've heard you kind of do it that yeah way. i mean of course coming from my background of midwest blue collar rock and roll that's how i heard it in my yeah. head you know i always heard it like a bruce springsteen song you know a rocking song but uh no no one's done that and i, I would love to hear it now, you're at the point in your career, was that your first really, really huge one? That was my first number one song. Okay. The, yes. And so, the, uh, tell me about the pitch, the Oak Ridge Boys, because when you heard it, the single, all of that. Because we, especially earlier in career, you know, everything's... Oh, everything. You're living on the cliff. Everything was monumental. I mean, you know, uh, my publisher at the time, Bob Beckham, uh, I remember we finished the demo and and our publishing company where I wrote, they all seemed to be really super excited about it. Uh, and Bob Beckham went and played it for the Oaks producer at the time, Ron Chancy. And it was like, okay, Ron really loves it. Okay, the Oaks really love it. And okay, they, they recorded it. <laughs> And we're just going, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it was a big deal for me just to have them record it. I thought, wow, well, I'm in. <laughs> now, what you want, what everybody, I don't know if you, the, 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 the cherry and the pretty candle on the frosting on the cake is it becomes a major commercial. How did that happen? Well. And tell people who it was for. And yes. It, it was unbeknownst to me, uh, but the story goes like this. There was an ad exec from uh, this big agency, J. Walter Thompson in New York City. And he was probably at the time one of 12 country music fans <laughs> in New York City, you know. And, and the story goes that he was on the plane uh, going, you know, going somewhere, and he started just going through the the music catalog that they just had, you know, on on board, and this song came up, you know, American Made came up, and he just put it together that this might be the song that uh, Miller Brewing was, was looking for for their anthem, you know, and so... Once again, my publisher, being very old school, he, he said, well, somebody's interested in your song. I said, oh, great. <laughs> I don't know what that meant, you know. And as it went on, he just kept letting us know a little bit more and what it meant. And and at the time, I was making $75 a week. So I couldn't conceive of of, of anything like this, you know. And it, it went on to become a a huge uh, anthem and it actually made the front page of the wall street journal regarding how a copyright can become more valuable beyond its life as a hit song and uh it was it really wasn't like having a hit song it was like the lottery that that and i know with all of your success and your even the mcgraw and everything you've got going all the chart topping stuff now everywhere you're still approached about that song is there a story a touching one a, a memory from a friend that, that reconnected you with that i haven't asked you about just tell me one because there's i'm sure hundreds to choose from there is but th this story actually happened and it happened to me uh back when the country music festival was still fanfare and they held it here in nashville at the fairgrounds they told me that the Oak Ridge Boys were going to play out there and they were going to play my song. And I had not seen them play my song, you know. So I just went in there, you know, and I didn't even go backstage or anything. I just, I remember getting up to the top of the bleachers and looking, you know, and, and they started playing American Made, you know. And I, I looked to my left and there was this 
big old country boy next to his big old country wife, you know, <laughs> and he was just slapping her on the butt going, my baby is American. <laughs> and it was just great, man. It was like, okay, there it is. This guy, this song is about this guy's wife. And there you go. Thank Time you very much. Mama call them. Mama and them. <laughs> Tell them somebody likes my song. And Bob, thank you. Thank you for your service to songwriters through NSAI and all you've done through the years. And well, thank you, Bart. Fabulous. I mean, they need to launch that again for another Miller campaign right about now. Too. I think so. Uh, so. I think they Oh, you know, it, a little P.S. It, was, it also for a while was the commercial for Baby Ruth Candy Bars for about a year or so. Look at me. Beer and candy bars. Can you imagine? Bob DeFiro, <laughs> American Made, the story behind the song this week for the Tennessean. Seems everything I buy these days has got a foreign name. From the kind of car I drive to my video games. I got a Nikon camera. A Sony color TV But the one I love is from the USA Nay, next to me 